As we go into our passage tonight, we are back into the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, and thank you so much uh, to you three who led us in prayer tonight. But our transition does focus a little bit in the Lord's Prayer to forgiveness, where we look at that fifth petition where Jesus calls us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And so again, we're in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. But please join me as we pray. Father, we turn our hearts and our minds now to Scripture. And Lord, we can't come to you and we can't comprehend you unless you take captive the mind. We sing that in another song that says, Not all our prayers or sighs or tears can bear our awful load, not what we say or feel or do. Lord, because you work through the mind, you've given us a book. And so I ask that that's what you do, that you take captive our thoughts, that you make them enslaved to Christ so that we can see him more, so that we can be sharper in our thoughts and in our attitudes, and that you can take what we learn about Jesus, about his cross, about forgiveness, and everything else that we see in this passage, and that you can take that knowledge and you can drive that into our hearts and that into our souls, And from there, as Lord Jesus, your own lips promised us, would flow streams of living water. Speak to us now, in your name we pray. Amen. Again, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is God's infallible word. Now, as we do tonight focus on that fifth petition, Jesus teaches us that when we are to pray, we are to pray for forgiveness. But this is a unique petition in that this is the only one in which there is a condition placed upon it. And it teaches us that in our daily lives, if we are unwilling to forgive, so too is God unwilling to forgive us. Now, as we untangle that and look at what that doesn't mean and what that does mean, it's, of course, been a long while since we've been in the Lord's Prayer. It's been a few months. This is our sixth message on it, spread over, I believe, eight months. And so we've taken this all very sporadically, and that means that it's very easy to lose the vision of what Christ is saying. We don't want to miss the forest here for the trees. And so remember with this prayer that Jesus is not giving us a magical incantation, as though we can just say these, they're this wonderful little Hail Mary that we can say and all our problems go away. Nor is Christ restricting us to these words. Rather, as we've hopefully seen and will continue to see, what these petitions do is they cover the vast multitude of anything and everything that we would ever need. But perhaps most importantly, they begin with a focus on God. You see, the whole Swiss Reformation, which happened roughly concurrently with the Lutheran Reformation, which the Swiss Reformation is where we get our history, was based on giving glory to God in all things. That's what defines the Reformed faith, giving God all glory. And that's what this prayer teaches us. It centered us back on God. 
And we see that as we go through it, if you see it backwards. When we get the things that we need, we are equipped then, the third petition, to do God's will. And when we do God's will, it means his kingdom is more and more manifest. It's made visible. And when that happens, it means that God's name is hallowed or glorified. And so since that's the case, and there's um, logic throughout all of this, what this means is that this is not just an abstract set of thoughts and petitions that Jesus came up with on a whim. Rather, they are the treasures and the desires of God's own heart. Christ is peeling back the curtain to say these are six things that God himself truly desires. And so when Jesus opens up the passage in verse 5, before the Lord's Prayer, which begins in verse 9, he reminds us, um, he, he instructs us not to pray like the hypocrites. And that really means by play acting. We talked about that. We see, um, not these guys tonight, I'm sure, but sometimes if you stand up here and you pray before the congregation, you're just worried about making sure you don't say anything dumb or anything like that, or around the table, you might lead your family in a prayer, but your heart might not be in it. That's play acting. That's praying like a hypocrite. And then he also says not to babble on mindlessly. It's not about the the quantity of words that you say. It's about, in essence, the quality where your heart is. And so after Jesus gives gives us those two instructions to not pray in those ways, he turns now and teaches us how to pray by inviting us into, again, the heart of God to ask him to carry out not necessarily what we desire, even though we should desire it, but to carry out what God desires. That's why Daryl Johnson, in his book, 57 Words That Changed the World, reminds us that these verbs are in the passive imperative. That is, if, you, if you've ever paid attention to this, you'll notice that these six petitions are commands. And that seems like a crazy way to speak to God. We begin by praying, hallow be your name. Give us this day our daily bread. Who are we in, that we could talk to God like that, right? These are imperative commands, and yet they are passive in the sense that when this is in the Greek, it's saying, you carry it out. I can't carry it out, but you do this. And that should really infuse confidence into all our prayers, showing us that if we align our hearts with God, if we desire the things that God desires, it is his desire then to answer our prayers. And the reason I want to focus on that, again, is so that we don't lose the vision of the Lord's Prayer, but because I think that is a tremendously shocking thing. And it's no more shocking, perhaps, than in our petition today. After all, how many of you here felt guilty at any point in this past week? How many of you battled with a sin or a failure, looked it straight in the eye, and felt just overwhelmed and defeated? Or perhaps at night you lay awake thinking of something foolish you did or something you said. Or perhaps you had a godly sense of fear, like the prophet Isaiah, who when he was swept up before the throne of God, could think of nothing to say except, "'Woe is me, I am undone.'" You see, when we read the Word of God, it contains no shortage of language that condemns the human heart. Look, for example, the well-known verse, Jeremiah 17, 9, which tells us that the the heart is wicked and deceitful, desperately so. It is completely untrustworthy. Psalms 14 and 53, and then Romans 53, they tell us all humans have fallen. None seek after the things of God. And because of this, the Scriptures tell us that the wrath of God is coming. Every sin that has ever been committed is guilty of hell. And so that means that when you were a two-year-old and you threw a temper tantrum, right there you earned for yourself eternal damnation. And our sins continue to pile and to pile and to pile. This is what Jesus means when in this passage he tells us to pray about our debts. Of course, sometimes we read the King James Version here and that uses trespasses. But the word is essentially the same, and it essentially means this. If you owe $10,000 to the government, there would be a time, probably, where you could pay that back. But if you owed $100 million to the government, and they called it in immediately, it doesn't matter how many people you know, it probably doesn't matter what you own, you will never scrape together enough to pay that back, and the only thing that awaits you then is the inside of a jail cell. That's what it is to have a debt. But our debt to God is bigger and it's greater. Who in the world can stand before him? Who can approach God and dare to say, here I am. I've earned salvation. Even as believers, we continue to stockpile sins faster than a greedy man piles up money. 
And if you don't think that's true of you, just imagine that tonight this room is full of your friends and your family, the people that know you best. And I call you up here and I say, here's a time when everyone in this room has an opportunity to point out a flaw, to point out a sin, to point out a way that you have failed or something that you've said that irritated them, anything. The people that know you best have free reign right here to say whatever they want that's true about you. Well, as you're walking up here, how trepidatious do you feel? And racking your brain, thinking of all the things that you've done, the things that they can bring out in public. And yet, when we see in Scripture the truth, we see that we stand before the face of God. And God, unlike our friends and family, can peer into the hidden depths of our souls and our hearts and our minds to see the unseen. This is why it is so stunning to see that we can't stand before God, that we've been earning hell every day of our lives, that when Jesus teaches us to pray, he says yes in that passive but imperatival voice, forgive us our debts. Wipe them clean. Take them away. Let them exist no longer. Now, think about the weights of that again. These are the desires of God's heart. He wants his name to be hallowed. He wants his kingdom come. He wants his will to be done. And yes, he wants to provide our daily bread, our food, our needs. After all, has anyone in this room gone without food for a day or a week? Obviously not. We're still here, right? And then he transitions to say God wants to do all those things, and he wants to forgive you. He wants to forgive you as much as he wants to provide your food each day. What Jesus is teaching here is that God is not reluctant to pardon, but that we who are so sinful and so regularly need to ask and repent for forgiveness will be granted it every time we ask. When the scriptures talk about God and his forgiveness, never are we given the picture of a grumpy old grandpa who needs to learn how to open his purse strings and give a little less cheaply. Instead, the scripture uses words like lavishes. He lavishes it on us. Look even at Isaiah 118, which says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, that being the picture of having blood on your hands they shall become like wool. Or Isaiah 32 verse 5 says, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Or Psalm 103 12, which Ed so beautifully led us in prayer this morning, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. He lavishes forgiveness on those who ask. But consider also a passage like 1 John 1, 9, which tells us that God is not just a forgiving God, but that forgiveness is actually tied to his justice. In other words, because Christ was sacrificed in our place, because his blood was spilt instead of ours, because his soul bore the wrath of God so that ours may be free, God would be unjust to exact a second payment on us. It says there, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Jesus is reminding us here in prayer that our God is so good and he is so loving and he is so ready and eager to forgive our sins that Jesus says every day since they stockpile before God, fall on your knees and ask that you may be clean. But notice again, of course, that there is a qualifier on this petition. Jesus adds, I think, Slightly fearful words, he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, our Savior never messes up a word and he never wastes a word. He means exactly what he says here. And that is, he's not saying forgive us as we try to forgive our debtors. Rather, it places again this stipulation. If we want to be forgiven by God, if we want to receive his blessing, if we want that to be lavished on us, it must already be exemplified in our lives. Now, what Jesus is not promoting is a works righteousness that says that if you are, that says that um, God is saying, prove to me you're worthy of my forgiveness. I will only forgive you if you forgive others. And we might think of it that way. Typically, that's how life works. You can consider, for example, a week from tomorrow, classes North Cascades, our classes, will examine two men for ministry. They will sit down and they will have to prove their learnedness and pass an exam in order to receive the credentials of ministry. And we might think, okay, that's what Christ is saying here. He's saying that if I'm not good enough, if I'm not forgiving enough, 
then God's just going to hate me, and I've got to prove this to him first. But that doesn't jive with the rest of Scripture, because Romans 8.1 tells us that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, we are not saved by our ability to forgive. Rather, this is instead talking about our daily walk with God. Because the result of forgiveness, without fail, is always that we will be transformed. So we've heard the saying before, justice is getting what you deserve, mercy is not getting what you deserve, and grace is getting what you don't deserve. And we have a terrible habit in the church of interchanging the words of grace and mercy. But we see at the cross of Christ, when our sins were paid for and forgiven, we didn't just not get what we deserve. We didn't just avoid God's wrath. We did, that was mercy. But more than that, we received grace. We got what we don't deserve, a new covenant that comes with a new heart. What the Old Testament tells us, Jeremiah 31, is that that new heart desires the things of God, and it acts as God does. And so that means that if you have tasted the refreshing, living, forgiving waters of God, we will naturally forgive others. This is what Christ is getting at here. Forgiveness at its core changes us. He says as much when he says, he who is forgiven little loves little. And the context in which he gives that is from a parable of two men forgiven debts. He tells this parable to a Pharisee. There is one man forgiven a small debt and then another man who is forgiven a great debt. And he asks the Pharisee, who is it that loves more? And he says the one, of course, that was forgiven the greater debt. He is the one who loves the forgiver more. He is the one who is going to give it out. And so what that means is that if we are unforgiving, what it reveals is that we have not been coming to Christ, coming to God to repent and to receive mercy and grace. Because as one pastor says, if we do not forgive, we are setting a higher bar than God does. It's revelatory of where we are in life. And this is why Christ then says in verses 14 to 15, he gives a small commentary on this petition only. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not Forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Again, only one who is repenting, only one who is receiving, will be able to give it back out. And so if we are unwilling to forgive, we prove ourselves to be unloving to God, and we will be cut off from his blessings, because we were never there in the first place. This is why 1 John, 1, 2, or 1 John 2 verse 9 says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brothers is still in darkness. And why Paul commands in Colossians 3.13, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And so again, to try and synthesize that and to put that simply, no, we are not saved by our ability to forgive. But if we refuse to forgive, we prove that we have never truly known God in the first place, and our hearts are still dead in sin. And that should drive us back to the cross to receive forgiveness. Spurgeon is, gives a great warning when he says, unless you have forgiven others, you read your own death warrant when you repeat the Lord's Prayer. So, just quickly before we end, what in the world does this teach us about prayer? Well, first, it tells us, of course, that we need daily when we pray. If we have to pray the Lord's Prayer for our daily bread, it means that we have to pray daily as well for forgiveness. Our sins are so great. Our sins are such a stench. We must come to God daily to name them, to repent of them, and to turn from them. But it also tells us that every time we sincerely do repent, God will forgive. But more than that, what we just looked at is that it teaches us that prayer is not just about the five minutes, ten minutes, one hour that we set aside to speak to God. Rather, prayer is shaped by our entire lives. So you can consider, for example, 1 Peter 3. There Peter tells husbands, love your wives, and then he gives a reason to it. He says, love your wives so that your prayers may not be hindered. Once again, what Jesus is teaching us in that stipulation is exactly what he says. We have to be forgiven. But what he's teaching us is that our prayer life 
And our connection to God is directly attached to the rest of our lives. So that if we're not coming back to the source, if we're not asking, if we're not um, repenting, if we're not receiving the love of, or if we are not um, chewing on the forgiving love of God to such an extent that we too are giving, that we too are loving, and that we too are forgiven or forgiving, we can understand and know that our prayers themselves are going to be unheard and hindered. You see, our life and how we're living should reveal whether we need to be coming back to this cross. And so what we must do is we must come daily to God to receive from him, and then we must go out and we must give to others. And that will fuel tomorrow when we can fall to our knees and say again, you have forgiven me, I have forgiven my debtors, forgive me again. The more we do this, the more we get into that cycle, not only will our everyday lives be transformed, but Christ tells us that then our prayer lives as well will be transformed. Let's pray. Father, we always, as always, we thank you for your word because it instructs, it guides, it admonishes, it teaches, it builds us up for righteousness. But Lord, as we've just prayed about forgiveness, we ask for it for ourselves. Lord, I don't know the sins of the individual hearts here. They don't know the sin of my heart. And Lord, if we are honest, we don't even know the sin of our own hearts. And so I ask that you work in us a willingness and a desire to seek and to search those out, but to never neglect a day of coming to you and of laying our sins before you and saying, Father, nail them to the cross. Forgive my debts. And Lord, I pray that as you have given us forgiveness, that as we stand with no condemnation in Christ Jesus, that we will have that natural consequence, that we will go out and that we will forgive. And Lord, where our hearts are unforgiving, where they are unloving, where our hearts are made of stone, let this be a warning to us that the ears of God are then closed and help us to fall again on our knees and to ask for forgiveness. In Christ's name, amen.